Hello everyone, going to start off today's video with an apology. You see, because for the next 20 minutes, I am going to be utterly, completely, unbearably smug. This video has been a year in the making, but it was so worth the wait. I am very pleased to be able to tell you that for the final video in my third anniversary channel celebrations, I am driving a 1993 Jaguar XJ220. I, I can't even believe the words as they're coming out of my mouth and I'm sat in this car. And when I received the email from this car's owner a year ago telling me about the cars that he had and offering them to me for a review, I saw this and I thought, that must be a typo. That, that can't possibly be. I've been offered an XJ220, a car that is so blindingly amazing, even my best buddy Laurie says it's better than a Toyota MR2. That, that's unheard of praise. You'll likely never ever hear a car described in that way by him ever again. And I'm in the fortunate position of being on the driver's seat of this thing. It's unreal. But I'm gonna do my absolute best to try and stay calm, level-headed, talk you through this car, explain to you what this experience is like from someone that never even conceived of the chance of driving one of these and is now able to do so on the public roads, no less. I've got to apologize that the roads aren't necessarily the best, but I'm gonna do absolutely everything that I can to make this a great finale for a fantastic month, which has been packed with some amazing cars. If you haven't been watching what's been going on, if you're new to the channel, hello, welcome. Please go and have a look. Granted, none of them was quite as spectacular as this, but we've had some pretty cool stuff in the last three years, to be fair, not just the last month. Let's talk to you about the XJ220 story. It all begins in 1984. You see, Jaguar was freshly separated from the yoke of British Leyland ownership and they were trying to make it in the big old wide world and establish themselves as a player and a company that could survive independently. They were doing very well in the racing, mostly thanks to their collaborations with TWR, Tom Walkinshaw Racing. And one of Jaguar's top boys, Jim Randall, I believe their head of engineering, he was sitting there one Christmas thinking, you know, it's a real shame that we're so good at this racing lark, yet we don't have a car that truly celebrates and reflects our current racing pedigree. Unfortunately, what Jaguar also didn't have was any money. And so the Saturday Club was conceived. A group of a dozen very talented and keen people all determined to try and make the ultimate Jaguar. And it was about four years later in 1988 that finally the XJ220 concept broke cover at the British Motor Show and so stunning and amazing was this concept that it completely took all the attention away from Ferrari. Who'd parked an F40 next to it? And as the story goes, Ferrari, so desperate for attention, then started putting scantily clad girls next to the F40. Still, nobody was interested. And then they got the girls to start taking their clothes off. And even the lure of nearly naked women draped over an F40 was not enough to avert people's gazes from this incredible machine. Now, the original concept was an amazing thing. It was a full three foot longer than a Porsche 959 and near enough the same over a Ferrari F40. It was a gargantuan, slippery eel of a thing. It had a huge great big V12 engine in it, four wheel drive, rear wheel steering. It was 
packed the rafters with technology and it promised, of course, a 220 mile an hour top speed. Jaguar said that only 350 were to be built at a price of £290,000. But even with that huge sum of money as a price tag, they couldn't stop people. Over 1,400, four times as many as there were slots, wanted to put down their £50,000 as a deposit for the car. Jaguar, it seemed, had a surefire hit on their hands. But unfortunately from there, it all went very wrong. As it was quickly realised that the over 5 metre, 202 inch long concept car was simply too big to go into production. It was, it was ridiculous, it was massive, it needed to be shortened. The V12 engine that was promised also was going to have some issues producing the power that they were claiming for it and meeting the current emissions regulations and so they decided to do something very pragmatic. They would swap the V12 with a twin turbo V6. I mean, what could be wrong with that? After all, Porsche's flagship 959 was powered by a six-cylinder twin turbo and they were asking a huge amount of money for that. The Ferrari F40 was powered by a twin turbo V8 and Ferrari wanted a lot of money for that and those at the time were changing hands for way over their asking price. It helped them shorten the car dramatically by about eight inches. It's still unreasonably long, but there you have it. In fact, now is as good a time as any to have a little walk around. And here she is, the majestic 220. I must say that in pictures I think these things look very, very dated, but when you see one in the flesh, they just look like a real piece of automotive art. Uh, parked in an ordinary residential street as this thing currently is, it looks like somebody sort of gone on a night out and sort of forgotten where they left their spaceship. It is a truly incredible sight to behold. And you really just don't know where to look first. So let's try and do it with some sort of order. Let's go front to back, outside to inside. Uh, first off, things that I never really appreciated about this car before. This big old splitter here at the front, which looks like it is adjustable. Um, massive, massive gaping classic Jaguar grill with a real proper old school badge on it. Then these huge cuts in the bonnet here through which you can see a couple of the fans that cool this car's chunky engine. Wing mirrors, a uh, 1980s, 90s supercar favourite, Citroen items as you'll find on a billion other different cars. Uh, please feel free in the comments to name your favourite car that uses these wing mirrors. Hallmark of any supercar in my opinion, big old intake on the side with a radiator clearly visible. Tires. Big, big, big tires. Difficult to get. As expensive as you imagine they might be. Um, if you've got an XJ220 or you're looking at buying one, make sure it's got good tires on it. At the back, of course, you have the heart of the car. That 3.5 litre twin turbo V6 power plant housed in this hugely long tail. I mean, I know I whinge all the time about modern cars getting too big. This thing is absolutely vast, even in 2019, and I cannot imagine in 1992 what this would have looked like. And if I've done this right, this will now come up. We are, and it lifts up pretty quick as well. It's a big old space in here. You can almost sort of feel that the, it does look like, look at, the, look at the top of this engine. It does really look like they've taken a V12 and chopped it in half, even though it's actually not where this engine comes from, it does kind of have that feel about it. It's a solid looking thing in here. See the catalytic converters there? They alleged if you rip those out, you will gain another 50 horsepower straight away, as if it was down on power to start off with. There's even a little light in the engine bay should you need to work on your XJ220 in the dark. Fairly beefy looking hoses everywhere, and um, this, more than possibly any other car I have known, feels like a proper race car for the road especially when you get around the back and you see what it looks like from here I always knew an XJ220 looked like this from here what I never appreciated was the fact that you could see straight through here and see a bit of bit of exhaust you can see the gearbox down there and look underneath the car you can see nearly all the way through but before we show you the inside I want to show you one of the cars more amusing features. No, not the uh, fuel filler cap, although I'm sure if you actually ever want to drive this with any regularity, you're going to have to use that a lot. I'm going to show you the boot. 
And from this day forward, I will never complain about any car's boot ever again. Because whenever, whenever anyone tells me the boot in their car is small, I'll say, okay, it's small, but is it XJ220 small? That's, that's it, everyone. That's, there's the luscious owner's manual, CD changer, CD changer cassette, and it's full. Uh, I have no idea where my camera stuff is going to go in there. This is going to be interesting. But this whole thing is just a work of art. Chassis is a large part aluminium. Mix of different materials. Uh, uh, these are not cheap cars and they are not cheap looking cars. But let's have a look inside. Love this little air vent here as well. And I just adore the XJ220 script sort of stamped onto the top of the head of that engine. So let's get in, which is not easy because this door, big as it is, doesn't really open that far. Um, you'll notice on here there is a number, 261 on this car. We don't actually know what that corresponds to. Um, it is not the car's chassis number, I can tell you that much. So let's see if I can descend into the vehicle because I'm going to need to. Right, getting my spare batteries that are in my pocket around is interesting. Wow, it's tight in here, really, really tight. And it smells like proper old school Ferrari. Yeah, I'm back as pretty much as far as I can go. Um, this steering wheel, well, oh, it does adjust. Oh, there we go. That's a bit better. Gives more room. <laughs> Very classic analog dials. And by far the coolest bit of an XJ220 is the spare pod that's over here. So when you get your legs in and you close this door, wow. Wow, 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 what a thing. What an incredible thing. Yeah, there's, there's cheap old British Leyland switches and, and stuff like that in here, and these air vents are cheap, and there's, there's loads of them as well. <sighs> no power steering. Speedo goes up to 220, as it ruddy well should. Rev counter goes up to seven and a half, which is quite surprising. <sighs> this is an awesome thing. The seats are actually quite sculpted. They hold you in much better than you would think. Unfortunately, this roof, uh, it's, it's not so much for show, because obviously it's real, it's real glass, um, but it doesn't open, uh, which is a shame. And oh, getting quite comfortable in here. Oh, this is lovely. This is lovely. So, clutch is heavy. Oh, yeah. Steering wheel looks nice and basic. Pretty dour in here. I mean, I think actually normally I'd be totally anti grey cars, but actually it, it kind of works. You feel really snug in this thing. And um, yeah, visibility is a bit compromised because you're so low. Let me try and give you my view. That's kind of what I can see, essentially. Um, so no idea where the front of the car is, and you know that there's loads of car. You can see just a little bit of the rear of the car. I don't know if I can get the camera to the right place there for you. Not quite, but I can just see a little bit of the car. See, kind of like that. And um, wow, little red start button down here which gets business going and entertainingly the exact same style of key that you'll find on Lotus Evora whole bunch of Jags whole bunch of Astons and Volvos and things of the period oh and um, cheap old looking little rear view mirror as well but leather on pretty much everything I wish I could get you guys the smell oh, I like the little grab handle here as well um, two fire extinguishers as well uh, one is the original and one is one that probably works because XJ220s in the past have been known to uh, catch fire. And so this owner does not want to see his pride and joy go up in flames. I can completely understand that. Oh my word. This is special. This is properly special. Incredible, isn't it? Unfortunately, things then started to go really quite badly wrong. Although Jaguar thought they had a full order book, a global recession ensued, which meant that all of the people that previously had money to buy one of these uh, didn't want it. It wasn't helped by the fact that many of the people that had bought slots then sold them on to speculators. You see, they paid £50,000 for a build slot and they were then selling said slot for, say, £150,000, £200,000 to someone that was fairly sure they were going to make easy money off the car when it arrived. And I suspect a lot of them used the massive change in specs as an excuse to complain and whinge and whine to Jaguar that the car they were promised was no longer the car that was going to be delivered. So um, a lot of them kind of paid Jaguar essentially to get out of their build slot and then the cars did eventually start to be delivered. Of the 350 originally planned, only about 281 actually ever were made. 
and some of them sat in showrooms until essentially the late 90s, going for as little as £150,000. Jaguar's masterpiece, a car designed to celebrate their fantastic heritage, instead became such a millstone around their neck that, according to a few sources, they basically disowned it. They wanted nothing whatsoever to do with it. And that is really rather unfortunate. And for many, many years, they were sort of languishing. I mean, they were never super cheap cars. They went down to sort of about £100,000 at one point, which, in the context of something like, say, a Ferrari F40 or a Porsche 959, is very cheap. But it's only in recent years that people have started to see the value in them. And possibly they've gained a lot simply by proxy. All the other cars in that period have gone up so much that it was inevitable that prices of these were going to go up. And this car was purchased by its owner originally as an investment. However, he's fallen for it quite so much that he is now determined that this car will never, ever leave his ownership. And, to be honest, I can see exactly why. As you'll have seen from the walk around, simply sitting in this thing is an utter event. I've been incredibly fortunate in my brief YouTube career to drive some very wild and very varied vehicles, but nothing is quite like this. I've had the pleasure of sitting in a Lamborghini Countach, and although that car is famed for its piss poor visibility, I think this one might have it beat. And I got a fair bit of stick recently in my Audi RS2 video because I said in that video that, yeah, in 1994, 1995, 315 horsepower wasn't an awful lot. And a lot of people sort of corrected me and said, no, no, that was loads of power, and it's loads of power now. Well, in 1992, this thing was making 550 horsepower. And it's quite quick. I've only just tickled the turbos there because I don't want to bother the speed limits or um, <clears throat> any policeman that might be nearby, but it can hustle. It really, really can. And I definitely don't want to break this one because they're not a hundred grand anymore. This one's probably about half a million quid. I will confess I am a touch nervous, but it is amazing how quickly you get used to it. Once you're on a bigger, wider road like this, the car's sheer size becomes a little bit less of an issue. At the moment you're on anything with any sort of bend or whatever, it is rather intimidating. But it does feel just ridiculously, incredibly special. It truly does. Driving it through town is quite an experience for a couple of reasons. Number one, you're basically driving a spaceship, so everybody is looking at you, uh, made all the worse by the fact that this one is covered in cameras. Uh, number two, the car is geared very, very long. Because it has a top speed of 220 mile an hour-ish, and only five gears, you can kind of do the maths on that one. Second is all you would ever need for, say, 40 mile an hour speed limits. Third, it just, it just isn't interested. So coming from a uh, Honda S2000 as I have today, it's about as opposite an experience as you could possibly imagine. What's also interesting is actually how easy this thing is to drive. I, I just expected, I don't know why, I just thought it was going to be a barge, something that was properly really unpleasant to pilot and actually that is not true whatsoever. This car does not have power steering. And I think at the time it got a bit of a battering for being, well, a bit of a porker really. And um, okay, it's basically 1500 kilos, which nowadays is pretty light. I just got out of a Ferrari 430, which would have weighed pretty much the same. As a driver's car, that Ferrari was superior in every single conceivable way. But it should really be, shouldn't it? This thing is just, it's an experience. It, it's pure and simple. It is just drama personified. It's also one of the very few cars that I would see in silver and go, yep, that's the right colour. It kind of adds to the whole sleek, futuristic look of the thing. And the clutch is not actually even that bad. Yes, it's certainly on the heavy side. Yes, if you're driving it through London, you get very tired of it very quickly. But on a day like today, which is probably the only time in my life I'll ever drive one of these things, I am certainly quite happy to put up with it and the car has so much torque at tick over that it's pretty fine. Uh, let's talk about that engine actually shall we? Other than the headline power figure it is actually quite a special thing. 
You see, people were upset that they weren't going to get a screaming V12, and I can kind of understand why. I mean, this is a very agricultural sounding lump. It, it's not a nice sounding engine, full stop. But it's got some serious pedigree. I mean, this is basically the engine used in the Metro 6R4 Group B rally car. It's, it's pretty stonking. Now, Jaguar never officially recorded a 220 mile an hour speed run out of this car, but I suspect given the right day and maybe with a car that was uh, <clears throat> healthy in the tradition of the E-types when they allegedly did 150 mile an hour, uh, I I'm sure it would get there. The one number related to an XJ220 that absolutely blows my mind is the downforce figure. Now, I'm not sure whether to believe it or not, but I've seen it quoted enough places that it's definitely a thing. They say this car at 200 mile an hour produces over 1,300 kilos of downforce. I've not misread that. That is nearly 3,000 pounds for my American friends. The whole underside of the car is shaped and sculpted. The entire thing is basically a big upside down wing with venturis and stuff going on under there. And actually when you see it up close, like you've seen in the walk around from the back, you, you can kind of start to believe that sort of thing. It does rattle quite a bit, um, quite a few noises and things coming from it. Now it's not actually that low, but it does have absolutely massive overhangs which means although speed bumps are not a, a big issue i would not take your xj220 anywhere near a multi-story car park uh owl just just don't do it horrible horrible things will happen now if you're curious about running costs on these well <clears throat> yes it's bad really bad those massive 345 section rear tires aren't often made and they are very expensive uh, when they are available uh, how expensive well i've bought cars that are cheaper than a pair of tires on this thing so um yeah <laughs> the fronts are a much, much more modest 255 section, a chicken feed really. It's actually quite comfortable, although it is rattling around like you would expect some sort of, you know, racetrack escapee to do. It's comfy, the seats are amazing. I, I want some, I love them, I certainly I can't afford them, but they are really quite cool. There was a sportier version of this made later called the XJ220S, which features some upgrades and things and some even more aero and stuff like that. But to me, it's the original, which is the one. In fact, I read an article with the unfortunately recently passed Jim Randall where he said that very few people realize that the, the concept car that was shown at the motor show and the real deal have nearly nothing in common. They are pretty much completely separate cars which is amazing because you would think that the opposite was true. The car actually wasn't even built by Jaguar themselves, it was built by Jaguar Sport, a collaboration between Jag and TWR. And when production of this was done, the factory moved on and built the then new Aston Martin DB7. It's dry, so I'm going to open the tap just a little, just a little bit. revs quickly and cleanly it it shifts i mean it really really shifts i i believe that power figure all day long it, it, it is a disappointment that the noise is cack I, 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 the owner and i completely agree the noise is rubbish but the rest of the experience i think rather does make up for it even stuff like the gearbox has a very long throw and all that jazz and it could do with some more ratios because you very often find yourself sort of not quite finding the right one but it's nice to use I mean they claimed at the time that they only put five in there because five was all that they needed I think the reality is probably close to the fact that they could afford a five-speed box and also they needed a five-speed box because they wanted it to be nice and beefy so it didn't just explode whenever you put your foot down the steering in the car is far friendlier than you would actually expect it to be it's a deliberately slow rack because there is no power steering here, but once you get beyond about five or 10 miles an hour, it really lightens up and is actually damn nice to use. 
I must take this opportunity to say what a superstar this car's owner is, because we've arrived on what is probably the worst road on planet Earth for an XJ220, and he's being um, very supportive. Perhaps another reason that the XJ220 didn't do very well was the fact that its USP was the fact that it was the fastest car in the world. A title it held for a sadly brief period because it was then eclipsed by the McLaren F1, which beat it quite thoroughly. And the McLaren F1 is again a totally different car. I mean, I can understand now why when you put these things on a track or whatever, or when they appear on the Grand Tour and they try and compare them with a the modern car, they don't fare very well because it was never going to. It never, never, ever. This, this is a car from a very, very different time indeed. But you know what? I expected this thing, I gotta be honest, to be rubbish. Like, I mean, seriously, like I expected it to be horrible. Actually, it's not. If you treat it with respect, and you appreciate what it is that you're piloting down the road, and you understand the fact that the brakes are not very good, and the tires are huge and sort of slightly old, and it can go a lot faster than it can slow down, you can actually, genuinely, enjoy yourself. You really, really can. Is it a car that could bite you? Yes, it's certainly a car that could make your day very, very bad indeed. But the XJ220 has made mine very, very good. Thanks everyone for watching. Thanks so much again to Mr. Zed for lending this to me. <laughs> I love this thing. I want one. I can't afford one though. So I better just bring this one back in one piece. Thank you for subscribing. Whether you did it today or you did it three years ago, I really appreciate it. If you haven't done it already, please, please do, because it makes things like this all the more possible. We'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.